The Brothers Karamazov. Everyone says The Brothers Karamazov is one of the must-read books before you die, topping countless lists of best books to read. But then you see the size of it and you think, yeah, I'm not that old yet. I get it, you're more tongue-tied trying to say Dostoevsky than you were on prom night, and with its sprawling page count and large cast of characters, it's hard to see the appeal of an 800-page family murder mystery. Oh, they talk about religion too? Yeah, I'm out. There's a reason Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky is hailed as one of the most skilled and respected writers of all time. Somehow, he figured out how to convince the people that have actually read the book to fall in love with it. Praised by the likes of James Joyce saying that he is the man more than any other who has created modern prose, and Virginia Woolf stating his novels were seething whirlpools, gyrating sandstorms, water spouts that hiss and boil and suck us in, it convinced people like Franz Kafka to even read his novels out loud to friends. And the list goes on and on with Nietzsche, Marquez, Murakami, all praising Dostoevsky. So, if we took his repertoire, and only one novel could rise to the top, the Brothers Karamazov sails into the picture. Both Albert Einstein and William Faulkner have claimed that the Brothers Karamazov is one of the best novels ever written. So yes, the Brothers Karamazov is a story of three brothers, a murder mystery, and the validity of religion, but it's really truly a quest to understand who are we? What makes something right? Because you said it? Because it's legal? Because a religion said so? The three brothers in this are so deep and complete, readers tend to find themselves in one of these characters. The point being, regardless of your background, this book touches on the core element of what it means to be a human being, how to actively love, and what is good in life, and does it matter who agrees with you. The novel transcends definition, dipping its toes into literary fiction, romantic comedy, courtroom drama, horror, epistemology, murder mystery, tragedy, and more. It has its flaws, and not ones that you need to look over, but maybe in the same way that we all have flaws as human beings, our books do too, and you can choose whether to love the imperfect things in your life or not. Because this book is one that is different every time that you read it, I think this can easily become many people's favorite novel of all time. Rather than just tell you what it's about, we want to give you an endorsement and spend some time talking about things that will help enrich your reading experience before starting The Brothers Katamasov. If you are new to the Codex Cantina, we are tackling some of the biggest and most important texts that have influenced even today's authors. If you're down for a conversational approach to discussing literature, make sure you hit that subscribe button to join us. Today, let's start off with our plan. What are you going to be getting out of this novel? Expectations versus reality. Author and publication information. Dostoevsky's Gospel. Russianology. And finally, the road ahead. Up first is the expectations versus reality. We want to address some of the concerns that we've heard people mention before even reading this book. Expectation one. The writing is difficult and complicated. Mm, yes, but no. When we talk about writing, are we talking about just the actual words on the page? Are we talking about the concepts that he's trying to convey? And Dostoevsky is a type of writer where he meant anybody to be able to pick up one of his novels and be able to read the book the first time through. And then arguably, more importantly, that you could reread this book to get more out of it through each read through. So how did he do this? The prose is incredibly clean, it's approachable, and it's lucid. To take an example... What is hell? I maintain that it is the suffering of being unable to love. We have mostly single syllable, maybe two double syllables, and the words are also words that young adults and maybe even some youths can understand. These aren't complicated words that he's choosing to convey his story in. See, as a writer, there's this fine dance that you have to do of making your literature go quick and fast to get to the point and draw the reader in, but also at the same time, you're having to set up all of these dominoes to have them fall at the exact moment you need them to so it feels appropriate to the reader and not too far-fetched. So while his writing is clean, there are these huge concepts that he's laying out through the beginning of the book that you don't even realize that he's doing. And additionally,
occasionally his writing style changes. There are chapters where it's just this romantic and very descriptive prose. There are sections that are taking more cues from the Bible with thou and and kind of the old archaic style of writing. And then even there's some poetry and diary sections too. Dostoevsky does a good job of even changing his writing style to kind of match the tone and feelings that he was going for in each section. I'd even say that this writing is varied for any type of author. So yes, I can see that the argument is that the concepts are complex, but this is all part of his setting up the dominoes, as Crypto mentioned earlier, to kind of deliver a very powerful message to the reader. Expectation two, that the book is about Dostoevsky's religious views and has a heavy Christian influence. Now, before we answer this, I think you need to be honest with what type of a reader you are, because there are some people where there are just hot buttons and they don't want to talk about that issue. If you're coming into this text looking for these are the answers and Dostoevsky says this is the way, I think you're going to be sorely disappointed. See, the thing is, Dostoevsky does a really good job of representing religious anti-religious views and problems with religion. He kind of admits in the novel that religion doesn't have all the answers and you have to stop pretending that it does in some of the passages. And he's not shy to use comedy. He will use in the opening section that the father, Theodor, will literally go into a monastery and just rips into the religious individuals there, teasing them about their chastity and just really ham fisting the uh, the scene there that it's, he's not afraid to take jabs, even at things that are important to him. This book is meant to be taken with a little bit of levity and a little bit of enjoyment because fiction is for fun. And we even have Yvonne, the half-believing atheist that to this day in all of literature all the philosophy has one of the most celebrated and documented challenges to theosity and a benevolent God. So it's not just this here's the blind Christian way. Dostoevsky does a really good job of challenging us as individuals to say, what does it mean to be a human being? And what we do, well, that's up to us. Expectation three, the cast of characters is too big and you won't be able to keep them all straight. So this novel is split up into 12 books and I think book one is correctly identified and misinterpreted as an info dump. So first, if you're worried about remembering everything as all these philosophies and religions and trying to keep the characters straight, Dostoevsky will do a great job of bringing this information back up throughout the novel when it is important. And don't forget, these books are meant to be reread, and every time you go through it, it's going to shed a little bit more light on the information, and you'll become more familiar with the characters. So why did I say misinterpret as an info dump? Some people will say that it's just his way of getting it out onto the table so that way he can jump into the action later. I'm going to point out that the narration of this is going to move around in the town. We're supposed to spend a little bit of time with different characters where no character is meant to be authoritative. Carol Emerson describes it as a way to grant validity to all voices. So it's a way of us being introduced to these characters but not becoming attached to one and it becomes disruptive or this one character's ideals pervert maybe how we view the other characters. Yes, and that's why you start off with Theodore and you're told that he's going to die right away. So is the cast too too big. Mm, it's big. I'll give you that. But is it too big? I think it's necessary for Fyodor to have attacked a lot of the ideas that he was attempting to do with this. And by introducing all of these characters and moving around very quickly between them to learn about them, we're going to disassociate with picking one narrator and maybe having prejudices based on following that main character around through the whole novel. So I would finally say, don't get too hung up on that there are so many different characters. Don't let that fool you. Don't let that not be able to tackle and enjoy this novel. Novel. Yes, there's a lot of different characters, but arm yourself with patience that you will become familiar with them and they'll just become part of the story and you'll read without any problems. Up next, we're going to talk about the author and some of the publication information behind this novel. Fyodor Dostoevsky is unlike any other Russian writer. He is a juggernaut unto himself. And while very often compared to Leo Tolstoy, they had very, very unique and different lives. 
Tolstoy being brought up in a upper class Russian family, where Dostoevsky will be brought up in a lower middle class family in 1821. He was raised on the outskirts of Moscow, and from a very young age, religion played a central force in his life to the point where even his schoolmates gave him a nickname after a very religious monk. Fast forward to June 16th, 1839, and we have two very important events happen in Dostoevsky's life. First, he learns that his father has been murdered back home, potentially by the serfs that have been taken care of the land. If you're unfamiliar with serfdom, that's going to play a somewhat central role with the clashal divide in this novel. But the idea is that these were kind of like slaves tied to land. And the theory is that potentially one of these serfs killed Dostoevsky's father. The second important thing that happened around this time, we don't know exactly, but around this time, he had his first epileptic seizure. And why does this matter? Because the neighbor that accused the serf of killing Dostoevsky's father was in the position to gain land at the suffering of others. And a key idea that permeates this entire novel is that of suffering and truth. And these were heightened by Dostoevsky's seizures, where he was claimed to uh, see things more clearly in these moments. Yes, and epilepsy became an even bigger part of the writer's life when just one month into writing this novel, Dostoevsky lost his three-year-old son, Alyusha, to an epileptic attack. So epilepsy and inheriting the sins of your father are key elements to helping us to interpret this text. They're going to be something that's going to be a central and driving force as you work through it. So this leads us to Dostoevsky's gospel, good versus evil, what is active love. As a devout Orthodox Christian, Dostoevsky had a lot of time to look at the people of this world and see suffering in them. We didn't mention it earlier, but he was sent to jail, and a lot of the time spent here, he could see how people suffered and what led to the suffering and how they dealt with it, whether they accepted it, whether they blamed it externally, or whether they tried to manifest it through physical aggressions on others. This ultimately led him to draw up these characters to be suffering in some way or another, whether it be spiritually, mentally, or even physically. But every major character in this story either witnesses suffering or participates willingly in suffering at some point in the story. Which leads us to two major points that one, Dostoevsky believes the world is suffering. And if you are familiar with 19th century Russia, we don't actually have a ton of economic data. But what we do have is the people's voices and their demand for reform. We'll get into the second industrial revolution a little bit later, but the world is starting to move much faster, becoming much more complicated during this late 1800s. And Russia is having a hard time keeping up with record levels of alcoholism, and experts will tell you that alcoholism, while a disease, is an escape, and typically an escape from some form of suffering. So when you're reading the story, make sure you pay attention to how each character is dealing with suffering. Do they lash out? Do they seek for help? Do they ask for spiritual guidance? Or do they even pay for what they think is sin? Which ultimately leads us to Dostoevsky's second point is that nobody is outside of salvation. Everybody deserves love and can participate in active love. Sometimes there is no answer to just suffering. There is no design. There's no magical force behind it. Sometimes things are just terrible. And what you need to do is kind of what Leo Tolstoy typically put as the three questions, which is to love the person closest to you. When do you do it? You love them now. And what do you do is you help that person. And choice is the really important part of that. Russia's consciousness is caught up in this maelstrom, this conflict of philosophies that crypto is going to go to in more detail here in a section. But what you need to know is that they spent a millennium under a church and state combination. It was not completely divorced the way that some countries, most countries actually move towards. Instead, Russia's church had a lot of power in how things were run. And that became into a huge conflict as atheism starts to push its way in and starts to tell people, this is what you need to be happy. Everybody gets this amount. And that becomes questionable when ultimately, as a Christian society, used to free will. And in the first section, you'll literally encounter people asking the church to enforce laws. It starts out heavy, but I promise it'll ease up. But throughout this whole thing, including the chapters like Rebellion or the Grand Inquisitor, which are infamous in the decision to follow God, is all part of this free will that we are used to exercising. And of course, the key to all of this is choice. So our next section is Russianology, where we're going to go into what you need to know about church and state in history 
of Russia at the time. So let's start off with the 19th century. The first thing that you need to know about Russia during the 1800s is that it's a very chaotic and tumultuous time period because Russia is trying to industrialize during this time period to catch up with the Western empires. The second industrial revolution has occurred and Russia has fallen behind because they stuck with agriculture for a little bit too long. It's truly an exciting time for Russia during the early to mid 1800s because technology is starting to advance very quickly and they're seeing that there's more progress Progress in their lives. There's a fear, though, of democracy seeping its way into Russian government, and the Tsar, Nicholas I, is fearful of losing his power. So Russia slowly starts to slide back into its more traditional ways and moving away from westernization. And by the 1860s, the idea of nihilism will start to rise to prominence in Russia. After many failed attempts through the 1860s, by the 1870s, Russia really has a really strong grassroots movement of nihilism perpetuating its way through the lower class societies. These lower class societies are looking to push back against this established hierarchy of Nicholas, the Tsar, and, and his power and all the upper class elites who lord themselves over these lower classes because they have jobs and money. And this is all leading towards a very important moment, which is the emancipation of the serfs and essentially destroying Russian feudalism. Because this is a grand shift in the socioeconomic hierarchy in all of Russia. So pay attention to what characters are given a a spotlight and what characters are kind of hidden and just behind the scenes. A lot of times a class background directly impacts how characters assign importance to these people in society and in their lives. And one thing to keep a note of when you're looking at these different characters is the money and their ambitions for money because this low, low pay scale is starting to slowly increase in conjunction with that, special taxes are starting to be put on these new freed serfs. And that's going to shift this paving the way towards further reformist ideas in the 1880s. So Dostoevsky is going to write about these struggles because this is his struggles. This is his family's journey as they were born from like a lower middle class society seeking out money and wealth and better opportunity. So this is reflected in Dostoevsky of how can a man survive with such little penance and he tries to comprehend the life of these low freed serfs in a troubled Russian nation. And he'll even use characters like the opening orgies and parties that Fyodor is going to throw in the book one, chapter one. It's all about throwing this decadence and this ridiculous wealth an uneven distribution compared to the lower classes. So what Brothers Karamazov does is it's this very complex and long story that transcends time because what he struggled with then is stuff that many of us still struggle with today. So for the road ahead, I cannot wait to get into some of these chapters like the Rebellion and the Grand Inquisitor, even the Parable of the Onion. This is going to be very exciting to talk about with you guys. This is one of my favorite books to kind of talk about and discuss and look at in new lights. If there's one thing that I hope to convey is don't be intimidated and don't put off starting this masterpiece because you don't have to do it alone. We're actively participating in a read-along along with Christy Lewis from Dostoevsky in Space, Peg from the History Shelf, and Victoria from a Musical Bookworm for hashtag Brothers Karamazov 2021. You can actively follow along on the journey in the playlist. We'll leave a link down below for you to discuss. And you can always hit us up on the Discord and have active conversation about this book because this is something where literature only gets better the more we talk about it together. So we would like you to join us on this journey into the masterpiece, The Brothers Karamazov. If you're down for that, please make sure you hit that subscribe button to follow us as we go on this journey together. Guys, we post videos every Monday and Thursday, and we can't wait to keep talking about Brothers Karamazov with you guys. Subscribe. Una out. Peace.